Jesus said in John 8, 24, I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins, for if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Sure, we have to have faith, but is it faith only? No. Luke chapter 13 and verse 3, Jesus said, I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall likewise perish. You shall all likewise perish. So we see that it is it cannot be faith only. Jesus said, you must repent. And also in Matthew 10, 32, he says, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. So now we have belief, repentance, and confession. And Jesus also stated in Mark 16 and verse 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. I despise, hate, detest, and loathe the Church of Christ and everything about it. I, I hate them. I really do. The better I get to know them, the more I hate them. I, I want to rid the world of the Churches of Christ. See why the atheists don't like the Martinsville Church of Christ? Services are 11 a.m. and Wednesday at 7 p.m. at 823 Starling Avenue. Watch them on TV in Martinsville at 9 p.m. on Comcast Channel 18 and on Sunday on WGSR. Real Local, WGSR 47.1 in high definition. The views expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect the views of the station, its employees, or ownership. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to A Word from the Lord. Jim's over here with you, and we're glad that you are with us. We hope you're ready for the study from God's Word tonight. We always want to start you off with our content information where you can reach us. We meet at 250 Boulevard in Eden, North Carolina. And you can reach me at 276-340-2653 or at A Word from the Lord at gmail.com. And, uh, you know, we want you to come out and visit with us, study the Bible with us. If you have an opportunity, we meet at uh, 9 a.m. for... Bible study on Sundays and at 10 a.m. for worship, and then we meet on Sunday, uh, Thursdays at 7 p.m. for Bible study, midweek Bible study. And, uh, of course, if you are in the uh, area, we want you to come by and visit with us. Uh, Bible questions are welcome. And uh, also, if you're in the area in Martinsville or Danville, uh, you can meet at 823 Starling Avenue in Martinsville. And there's content information for Micah and for Eugene, 120 American Legion in Danville. Is how you can reach uh, Mark, and so we want you to go out and study with, study the Bible with those uh, good brethren, and uh, anytime you have a chance to do that very thing. And so again, uh, all the programs, uh, Word from the Lord, uh, what does the Bible say? They're they're free of charge. If you'd like a copy of any of these lessons, uh, we'll be glad to uh, make you a DVD free of charge and get those out to you. Just let us know. And again, you can reach me at a word from the Lord at gmail.com. And we'll be glad to, to do that very thing. Uh, we uh, Tonight, we're going to be discussing uh, a, a topic that I, I think is more like a, a, a Bible class, maybe a lesson, maybe some uh, teaching. And you may have some questions about this, and you can call in uh, uh, when we put the phone numbers up uh, after a little while. We'll be glad to uh, answer your questions uh, uh, on, this, on this subject. But we get these uh, from time to time, and uh, it's, it's always good to know maybe how to answer or to increase your faith on this particular matter. And so tonight's lesson is designed to do that very thing, and that is to assure you that the book that we call the Bible is indeed a word from the Lord. You know, when we're talking about the Bible, oftentimes people say, well, you know, the Bible is... Uh, is, is nice and, and uh, I, I think it's I think it's God's word, but when it when it comes down to uh, a following it, then they start trying to justify why they don't follow it. Sometimes you hear people say, "Well, 
you know, uh, that, that book is just uh, 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 put together by a bunch of men. Uh, men put the book together, and, you know, it's come down from generation to generation, and, you know, it's been translated all the different times, so you really can't trust the Bible to be the Word of God, not not inspired Word of God. It, it kind of has a, 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 a name to be the Word of God, but it's really not because men have put different things into it, and so it's really not the inspired Word of God like many people say. Well, friends, I can assure you that, uh, as we always say, if you ask what does the Bible say, you'll get a word from the Lord. And, uh, you know, that's what we title this show, the word from the Lord and what does the Bible say, it's because we're, we're, we're convinced that the Bible is indeed the Word of God. And I want you to be able to say with the same confidence that indeed this is the Word of God. This is, you know, if you, if you ask, if you go to this book, you'll be getting a word from the Lord. You'll be getting what, what the Bible has to say. And so uh, how do you know that, though? You know, if the Bible is the Word of God, how do, you, how do you know that it's indeed the Word of God? How do you know that somebody didn't come along and just put certain books into it, certain writings into it, and that, now it's changed. It's no longer the Word of God, if it ever was. Well, friends, here's what I want, want to encourage you to consider. And that is when, when you look at the Bible and you are, are wondering if the, the words, the books, the writings that are inside, that are encased in this one book are inspired, then please consider this. Please consider what we're about to say. And then uh, later on in this lesson, what we're going to do is we're going to, to show you, we're going to demonstrate uh, the the Bible, the writings that are that are in the Bible versus some writings that are not in the Bible, some writings that are maybe uh, allegedly inspired. We'll get to that in just a moment. So, but when you look at that, you're going to see you're going to see a, a, a stark difference. I mean, it's a great contrast between what the Bible has to say versus what some of these other writings have to say. So first, how do you get the Bible? How do you, how do you get the books that are in the Bible in the Bible? Well, let's, let's start with, let's, like I said, this is kind of a, a, a lesson. It's kind of like a Bible class, a, uh, maybe kind of academic sort of thing, but we're not going to make it too, we're not going to make it hard on you. Uh, but when you talk about the books that are in the Bible, they make up the canon of the Bible. Now, now that, that's kind of a fancy word. You might not have ever heard it before, but but the the the, uh, the idea of the canon is is not like a gun canon. It's it's C A N O N, and what it really means is a measuring rod, or a measuring a stick. It's a standard, and so in other words, when when books are put into the Bible, the the Bible, the biblical canon, they have been measured, they have been tested, and they have been scrutinized to see if they fit. All right, now just think about it this way. When you talk about a, a carpenter, a carpenter that's building a house, he measures the lumber. He measures the boards that he's going to build, that he's going to build with, and he measures it, and then when he cuts it, it will fit where he wants to fit. So it, it meets a certain standard. It meets a certain criteria. Well, the Bible is held up, the books of the Bible is held up to a, a standard that is, that is uh, going to make uh, the, the books that are in it they're going to be carefully measured to see if they fit that standard. Now, the reason why we call it a canon is because it comes from a word uh, that, that, that sounds kind of like canon. Uh, in uh, uh, Ezekiel, Ezekiel 40 and verse 3, uh, listen to what, what the Bible has to say here, Ezekiel 40 and verse 3. Now, Ezekiel is talking about a vision that he's, that he's having, and he says, he brought me thither and... And behold, there was a man whose appearance was like the appearance of brass with a uh, line of flax in his hand and a measuring reed. He stood in the gate, and he stood in the gate. Now, that word measuring reed, the, the Greek word is pronounced kana, something like that. It's, it, it sounds kind of like canon. It's spelled, if you put it in English words, it would be something like uh, K-A-N-E-H or, or K-A-W-N-E-H, something like that. And so it sounds kind of like canon, where we get the word canon. But in the Greek word, you also have this word in the Greek, in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 16, Paul said, as many as walk according to this rule, 
And that rule is a is a standard. Is, as a matter of fact, if we uh, uh, I'm gonna put the I'm gonna put our the Greek words up here, put our interlinear up here, and you'll see you'll see the word canon right there. As many as walk according to this rule, all right. There's canon right here, K-A-N-O-N. So uh, uh, to this rule, this rule is is canon. So let's talk about a measure. It's talking about a standard, something that you go by. And so the Bible has a a standard. It has a measure that ha these books have been measured to see if they in fit as being classified as the inspired Word of God. Now, I can assure you that if you if you scrutinize the Bible and you're looking to see if there's if they're inspired, you're going to find some some earmarks. You're going to find some proofs of inspiration, and therefore they're going to be then categorized as, hey, this has to be inspired. Now, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of ways you can determine whether something is inspired or not. And, uh, uh, you know, one of them is, does it claim to be inspired? I mean, that's kind of a, a, an obvious one. It, does it claim to be inspired? Does the book itself claim to be from uh, the mouth of God? Well, Paul said in 2 Timothy 3, 2 Timothy Chapter 3 and verse 16 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for, do for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect and thoroughly furnished with all good work. All right, so this idea of God breathed, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And that word means God breathed. Every word came from the mouth of God. God breathed it. All right, so all scripture is inspired. And so if you find a book that doesn't even claim to be inspired, you know right off the bat, well, you know, there's, there may be some problems here. But there's some other earmarks, and we're not going to go through all of them, but I'm just going to give you a few of them. Uh, does it contradict something that you know is from God? If a Bible fits, if a Bible harmonizes with works, uh, other books that are known to be inspired, then it is considered to be inspired, all right? It, it has to be in agreement. It's not going to contradict. So these books that, that are in the Old Testament, they have been scrutinized and scrutinized, and the ones that, are, that were not, uh, didn't, measure, didn't measure up, literally if they didn't measure up, they were not put into the Bible canon. They were not put into the standard that we say is the Bible. All right? Now, how do you know, how do you know that the books that are in the Bible how do you know that they have been measured and how do you know that they have been, uh, that they're accurate? How do you know that they belong there? Well, first of all, you need to consider something. Did a man just come along and decide, well, I'm going to put this book in the Bible? Did a man just come along and say, well, you know, I think this book needs to go in there. I think this book needs to go in there. Let's put them all together like in a big library. Well, friends, that is not how the b biblical canon was put together. God is the one who determined what books should be in the Bible. Now, when you read through the Bible, you'll, you'll uh, come across some other books that are mentioned that are not in the Bible. All right, you've got the book of Jasher, for example. All right, you have uh, Moses says, write some things down in a book. Well, where are all those books? You know, we have some uh, uh, books of the kings of Israel, the chronicles of the kings of Israel. Well, we don't know where those are. The, the books that we call Chronicles, 1st and Chronicles, they're just about the, uh, uh, the kings of Judah. So there are some books that are mentioned that we don't have, but the ones that we do have are there and preserved because God intended for them to be in the canon. Now, men, men don't really get a say in what's in the Bible. What men have to do is have to recognize the inspiration, the earmarks that show that, yes, they belong in the Bible. This book is indeed inspired. This book belongs in the Bible. And so it doesn't really matter if a man uh, accepts it or not. God is the one that, that has determined it. And therefore, it's up to man to accept it. Let me give you an illustration. Let me give you an illustration about this. In Acts chapter 15, 
In Acts chapter 15, the, uh, uh, the early Christians, first century Christians came together and they came together to discuss whether circumcision was essential to salvation. Now look at this. Uh, and certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of the Jews, after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Where, when therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas uh, and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. All right? So they go up to Jerusalem, and they're going to have this question, and they're going to bring it, in, and uh, some people call this the Jerusalem Council. They're coming together, they're going to discuss whether circumcision is essential to salvation or not. Now, they go through, and Peter gives his discourse, and Paul tells what's going on, and James tells what's going on, and they all have a big discussion about it. But the bottom line is, when they, when they finish up, if we come down to about verse 19, come down to verse 19, notice what they say. Uh, this is Acts 15, 19. Wherefore my, my sentence is this, that my, wherefore my sentence is, my conclusion is, that we trouble them not which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write them and uh, uh, tell them to abstain from pollution of idols, in other words, stay away from the things that are, that are associated with idol worship, fornication, things strangled, and, and the eating of blood and so forth. Uh, that's what you need to stay with. Now look at this. Look at verse 23. Uh, and they wrote letters by them after this manner, the apostles and elders and brethren send greeting unto the brethren, uh, send greeting unto the brethren from, uh, unto the brethren which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, for as much as when we heard that certain have, uh, which went out from us have troubled you with words subverting your soul, saying, Ye must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. So their conclusion was, we are not going to tell them they need to be circumcised. All right? Now, they came together to discuss whether circumcision was uh, mandatory or not, whether you had to keep the law of Moses to become a Christian or not. Now, let me ask you, did that become true when they determined that we're not going to bind circumcision? When did that, when did it become true? When was it true that circumcision was not going to be bound on the Gentiles? Was it when they came together and decided it? No. It was true when God determined that it was not going to be so. It, when God said no Gentiles are not going to have to be circumcised, that's when it was true. It was up to men then to come together and figure out, okay, let's be certain on this. It's not essential for them to be circumcised or to be saved. Now they just realized what God had already determined. You see that? And so the same thing is true with, with uh, the books that are supposed to be in the Bible. God has already determined God has already determined what is true. It's up to man to then to accept it. Notice this in Psalm 119, verse 89, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. God has already settled the truth. It's up to men to accept it. All right? And so the Bible is, is put together by God, and the books that, that are preserved are preserved because they fit the criteria and they fit the uh uh, the, the standard that, yes, they're inspired. And as they have been handed down and as, have, as they've been uh, uh, written and recorded and preserved, they are preserved because they are known to be inspired. All right? That, that's why they were preserved. Look at this. In uh, Isaiah 40, Isaiah 40 and verse 8, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Now, friends, if God intended for His words to stand the test of time, they're going to. And the books that you have in the Bible are the ones that God intended for us to have. Now, let's talk a little bit about 
the books of the Old Testament, for example. How do you know that the books of the Old Testament belong in the Old Testament? How do you know that those, those books, the books of Isaiah and uh, the books of Genesis, the book of Genesis and, and Joshua and Judges and Ruth and Esther and the Kings and, and uh, Nehemiah, how do you know that those books belong in the Old Testament? All right? <clears throat> well, let's just consider this. Let's consider this because the Old Testament was written a long time before our Lord even came on the earth. All right, so let's consider this. I want you to consider the books. This is the old, the Jewish Old Testament canon. In other words, these are the books that the Jews considered to be inspired. Now, they would be considered to be inspired because, number one, they would have been preserved as the prophets, all right, that were known to be prophets of God. Their writings would be preserved. And number two, the other marks of inspiration, like they claim to be uh, inspired of God. They uh, reveal the truth of God. There's no inconsistencies in them. They're, they're prophetic in nature. In other words, they talk about events that are later going to happen, like Isaiah prophesied that uh, Cyrus would, uh, uh, would be the one that would uh, send the Jews back out of captivity. Isaiah, this is Isaiah 45, verse 1. Thus said the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue a uh, nation before him. Him I will loose and uh, the loins of kings to open before uh, him the two leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. Uh, Cyrus was the one that, that was going to send the Jews back to Jerusalem to be built. Isaiah 44 and verse 28. And this took place hundreds of years before uh, the event actually takes place. Isaiah prophesied of it. So this is proof that this was inspired, that this is uh, 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 a inspired writing of God. And so the Jews would preserve this. They would, they would keep writings like this because they knew that, yes, the hand of God is behind the, the, the writing of this book. All right, so that's just like one little little earmark of inspiration, but the Jews kept these books. They 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 were preserved. They met the standard of yes, they're inspired, and so they guarded them, and they preserved them. Now, in the the Jewish Old Testament canon, uh, Josephus, who was a Jewish historian, he's he wasn't a Christian, but he was a Jewish historian. Uh, he actually says that there are twenty two books in the Old Testament canon. Now you say, well, James, we have 39. Uh, well, that's, that's true. That's true. We have 39 because we divide the books up. The, the, the King James Bible that we have, you know, divides uh, 39 books up. But the Jews, oftentimes what they did, they would pair uh, some books. They would couple books together that were, con that were contemporary. That means they were set in the same time frame. They would put them together. For example, like notice this. We have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Everybody knows those first five books, the Pentateuch, the books of the law, all right? Moses wrote those. Moses gave those. This, this is the Pentateuch, all right? No doubt about these. Everybody says Moses, you know, these are, these are the law of Moses. But look at this. In number seven, you have Joshua, and you have Judges and Ruth. Now, why would someone put Judges and Ruth together? Well, they're back-to-back -back in our Bible. But consider this. Here's why. Look in Ruth. Sorry about that. Misspelled that. Ruth chapter 1. In Ruth chapter 1, the very first verse starts out, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled. So Ruth itself identifies as being set in the time of the judges. So it makes sense that those two books would go together, all right? And so Judges and Ruth were, were, were oftentimes put together. You had books like First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings. Those were uh, uh, just one big book, all right? Or they were all together. If you probably, if you open up your King James Bible, uh, the heading 
uh, in on First Samuel says the first book of the Kings. Second Samuel is called the third book, the second book of the Kings. First Kings is called the third book of Kings, and Second Kings is called the fourth book of the Kings. All right, so you, they put these books together. Uh, the Chronicles are put together. Also, you have uh, 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 down here number number twenty two. You have the twelve prophets, and oftentimes what we're done is the the uh, the minor prophets were just called the twelve. And so, if you add all these up and include the the books that are kind of put together and bound as one book, then you have twenty two. But they're all the same books that we have today. They're the they're very same books we have today. And here's why. Notice what Josephus says. Now, I hope you can read this. He says we have not 10,000 books among us disagreeing with and contradicting one another, but only 22 books which contain the records of all time, all right, and are justly believed to be divine. Five of these are by Moses and contain his laws and traditions from the origin of mankind unto, until his death. From the death of Moses till the reign of uh, Artaxerxes, king of Persia, who reigned after Xerxes, the prophets who succeeded Moses wrote down what happened in their times in 13 books, and the remaining four books contain hymns to God and precepts for the conduct of human life. So there's the Psalms and the Proverbs, the Song of Solomon, things like that. And you have the prophets that are, that are recording the things that happened in their time. And so Josephus is saying, look, this is... You know, we, we held these to be divine. Now, there's a reason for that. It's because they met that criteria. They held up to the standard. Now, I want you to consider what our Lord said. Because remember, the Old Testament, the books of the Old Testament were written long before Christ came on the scene. They would have been, you know, they would have been preserved for hundreds of years. I mean, if you think Malachi was the last, Malachi was the last, prophet that wrote and then 400 years of silence before Christ ever came on the scene so for at least 400 years nothing was being written so the Old Testament Bible the Old Testament canon, the Jewish canon the books that they considered to be divine would be at least 400 years old before Christ came on the scene but look what Jesus <coughs> said in Luke 24 and verse 44 and he said unto them these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Now he, he gives out three uh, different categories, if you will. In other words, three different uh, uh, sections of the, of, of the Old Testament. He says the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. Well, Here's how the Old Testament, the Hebrew Old Testament, was, was arranged and classified. It was arranged by the law, the prophets, and the writings. And, of course, you see that here, Psalms is the first one in the writings. So Jesus noticed or acknowledged three different groups or three different divisions in the Old Testament. The, the Hebrew Old Testament, and in those Old Testaments, in, in those uh, uh, three divisions, you have all the books that we have today in the King James Bible. Now look, there's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. There are the prophets, the book, the writings of the prophets, Joshua, Judges, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st name of Kings, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, of course the 12 minor prophets. And then you have the writings. You have Psalms, Pro, uh, Psalms, Job, Proverbs, Ruth, Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, Lamentations, Esther, Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, First Saint Chronicles. Now, you say, well, James, these are, these are in different orders than what we have. Well, they may be in different order, but they're still the same book. See that? They're still the same book. The same writings have been preserved. And so the, the same 39 books that we have, the contents of the 39 books that we have were exactly what Christ had. And he acknowledged that those books were indeed the law, the prophets, and writings. Okay? Now, <clears throat> look at Luke 11 and verse 51. 
Luke 11, verse 51. Jesus, in talking to the crowds, the people that would reject him, and I'm going to back up and get a little context here. Luke 11, 51 is what we want to look at. Uh, <clears throat> let's start in verse uh, uh, 48, 11, 48. Truly ye bear witness that ye allow the deeds of your fathers, for they indeed killed them, and ye build their sepulchers. Therefore also saith the wisdom of God, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them shall they slay and persecute, that the blood of all the prophets, which was shed from the foundation of the world, now that's important. Shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation. Now he's going to talk about the blood of prophets shed from the foundation of the world. <clears throat> and he says from the blood, now he gets specific, from the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zechariah, which perished between the altar and the temple, verily I say unto you, it shall be required of this generation. Now Jesus lists Two prophets. He are not two prophets. He lists two individuals whose uh, yeah th th whose blood was shed, Abel and Zacharias. Now, friends, that's important. That th those two are important because Jesus is saying something when he named Abel and when he named Zacharias. Let me ask you this. Let, before I explain this, let me just say this. What if I told you we're going to spread the gospel from New York City to L.A., California? We're going to spread the gospel from, from North Dakota to the Rio Grande. Now, what I just did was I gave you two opposite points, New York, to L.A. You know that's on the East Coast and the West Coast. If I said, if I said we're going to drive coast to coast, New York to L.A., we're going to spread the gospel from New York to L.A., you know I'm talking about one from one point to the other, from the farthest point east to the farthest point west. Or if I said from North Dakota to the Rio Grande, I'm talking about a, the northern point, the northern part of, of the United States to the southern part of the United States. And so I'm giving you two points that will contrast the, the, the distance. Well, that's what Jesus is doing. Jesus is saying from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah. Now, why is that important? Because look again at the, <clears throat> at the arrangement of the Old Testament. Genesis, Genesis, and the last one down here in the writings is the Chronicles. Now, by the way, the Chronicles were not written during the time of the kings. They were actually written after captivity. See that? So they're actually closer to the end of the Old Testament time period. All right, now, but, but my point is this. Jesus is using what is known in the Old Testament. He's talking about a reference point in Genesis, which was the beginning and he talks about a reference point in the end. Look at this. Genesis chapter 4 and verse 8. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. Well, there's Genesis. And then we talk about Zechariah. Where does Jesus go? 2 Chronicles 24 <clears throat> and verse 20. Put this up here so we can see a little better. 2 Chronicles 24 and verse 20. And the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, the priest, which stood above the people and said unto them, Thus <clears throat> saith uh, God, Why transgress ye the commandments of the Lord that ye cannot prosper? Because ye have forsaken the Lord. All right? Why are you transgressing? Because you've forsaken the Lord. Be and uh, because you have forsaken the Lord, he hath also forsaken you. And they conspired against him. And stoned him with stones at the commandment of the king in the court of the house of the Lord. 
Now, what did Jesus say? He said, from Abel to Zechariah, from Genesis to the Chronicles, the Second Chronicles. That's like us, like me saying, we're going to study the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. We're going to study from one end to the other. Jesus said, the blood is going to be upon you from Abel to Zechariah. Now, that wouldn't mean anything if, if the Chronicles was right there in the middle of the, of, the, uh, 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 of, the, of the Hebrew Old Testament. If it was right in the middle, that wouldn't mean anything. That would be like me saying, we're going to study the entire Bible from Genesis to Proverbs. Well, well, what about everything that comes after Proverbs? See that? But if you give the starting point and the ending point, now you've, 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 you've covered the whole thing. You've given the... Uh, you, you've given the, the beginning and the end, you might say. So what Jesus did was he named a righteous person in the book in the beginning and a righteous person at the end of the Hebrew Old Testament. And thus, he recognized that that was the Old Testament canon. That was the inspired word of God. That would be the Bible of his day. And he put his stamp of approval on it by saying everything from Genesis to the Chronicles is the word of God. Now, friends, if, if Genesis to Chronicles, the 39 books in the Hebrew Old Testament, if the same content is good enough for Jesus to be called the Bible, it's good enough for me to be called the Bible. See that? I don't need anything extra to be added. But what you have is you have, you have these books. You have these books that have been uh, verified to be inspired they've been confirmed to be inspired because they're written by prophets written by known men of God they're accurate in their writings they're, they're factual in their content the prophecies have come to pass and thus they were preserved as the inspired word of God and so Jesus didn't say well you know I don't know if all these books are really the word of God he didn't have a problem accepting them so why should you? Why should you have a problem accepting the same content of the Old Testament that Jesus accepted? See that? Now that's the canon. See, and here's why. Here's why. Here are these earmarks. These books all claimed inspiration. They claimed to be from the, from the mouth of God. Genesis 6 and verse 3, it says, God talked. You know, God spoke to, uh, to Noah. Genesis 6 and verse 13 God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh shall come before me. Well, it's verifying that God is talking. Now, Moses is writing this. Moses is recording this a long time after the fact. Well, Moses wrote this. Moses talked with God. Moses was a friend of God. Talked to him face to face. So, surely, surely there's a reliable source there. So if a book claims inspiration, Numbers 1, verse 1, uh, Deuteronomy 1, 1, these all claim inspiration. Second uh, Samuel 23, 2, 2 Samuel uh, 23 and verse 2, David said, now this is the words of David, the Spirit of the Lord spake by me and his word was in my tongue. Now, you say, well, a lot of books can claim inspiration, but that doesn't mean they're inspired. Well, that, that's true. But if they claim inspiration, then they're going to have to not contradict things that you know are inspired as well. And so these, these all claim to be inspired. These are all, all from, the, from the mouth of God. I mean, uh, Leviticus is 90% quotes from God. And so when you talk about do we know the Old Testament is, is the inspired word of God, well, those books belong in the Old Testament because God put them there and they were preserved as the inspired word of God. And like I said, Jesus didn't have a problem with them. Jesus didn't have a problem with them. He didn't say, well, something's missing here. Something's being left out. There's not enough information there. No. He accepted this very same thing we have in the, in the Bible today as the inspired word of God. Now, somebody said, well, what about, what about books like the Apocrypha? What about the Apocrypha? Now, you, you may have never heard of the Apocrypha, but if you're a Catholic, you have. 
And it could very well be that you have a Bible that maybe has the Apocrypha included in it. Well, what is the Apocrypha? Well, Apocrypha just means hidden. And so it's the idea that there's, these are some books that uh, should be in the Bible, but they've kind of been moved or left out. They, they belong in the Bible. But I submit to you, friends, there's a reason why the Apocrypha is not in the Bible canon that we have today. And that is because it doesn't meet the standard. They just don't meet the standard. They just don't add up. And so we're going to look at some reasons why. But the one thing I want you to do, I want to, I want to bring up to your attention, is that some people get their doctrine from the Apocrypha. And that's why it's important to know why some books don't belong in the Bible. And, but you can have confidence that what you do have in the Bible is indeed the Word of God. All right? Now, what I'm going to play for you is a phone call. Uh, Micah is talking to a man named Eli James. You may remember that, that I had a debate with Eli James uh, back in uh, 2011, I believe. He's the uh, uh, former Imperial Clud for the Ku Klux Klan. And uh, basically, he says they're basically getting their doctrine that is their doctrine that they believe the, the white man is, is the, uh, uh, the, the chosen people of God. Well, he says he gets it from the book of Maccabees, which is in the Apocrypha. All right? If you've got a Catholic Bible, maybe your friend's got a Catholic Bible, go look at their Catholic Bible and you'll find the, the, the ap Apocrypha books in their Bible. You'll find... Uh, um, first and second Maccabees, you'll have uh, Tobit, you'll have uh, Baruch and Judith and I don't know what all, the canticles of canticles and, and so forth. So uh, you'll have all these books that are in the Apocrypha, but they're not in the Bible. But this man gets his doctrine from it. Now listen to what he says, and we're going to show you how why this is dangerous because you're actually getting your doctrine from a book that doesn't meet the standard, all right? Here's what he has to say. Starting at 745 B.C., after the split of the northern house and the, and the southern house, what happened to those ten tribes? What's they that? migrated across the Caucasus Mountains and became known as Caucasian people. All right, now, let me tell you what he's saying. He's talking about the, the ten tribes that were carried off into captivity, the northern tribes. Uh, of Israel were carried off into captivity and he says they were dispersed, they were lost, the lost tribes and they migrated over the Caucasus Mountains and now they're, they're now known as the Caucasian people and he's telling Micah where he gets this information. Sir, you cannot prove that in scripture. I have no I idea what book you're reading. Right. This is in first and second Kings. What do you think? Uh, it's, in, it's in the book of Maccabees. Look at uh, Isaiah. Book of who? The book of who? Second like Maccabees. Look what, what in is Isaiah eleven sixteen. What is what is the book of Maccabees? <laughs> okay, I, have, well, I have here I have here my King James from Genesis to Revelation and I don't see Maccabee in there. Well it was in the original King James before oh, it was okay. taken out. Okay. All right, it was in the original King James is what he said. Now friends that, that's very important because some of you are gonna are know the date of the the King James. When was the King James Bible uh, commissioned to be written? You know, when, when was it? When was it written? You got your King James Bible. You probably open it up, and and uh, you're gonna you're gonna see something about the original uh, uh, the original tongue translated out of the original tongues, and and so forth. And and when was that? When did that take place? When did they? Uh, uh, when did they uh, translate? The King James Bible, most of you are going to know it's 1611, right? Well, remember that date, 1611. 1611. Because guess what? The Apocrypha, the Apocrypha, which contains the book of Maccabees, it was not accepted as inspired until, until 1563. So, so these books have been written, and supposedly... They, they were written during that 400 years of silence between Malachi and, and, and Matthew. 
And so it wasn't until, uh, what, almost uh, uh, 1,900 years later that they are accepted as inspired? Now, now think about that. Now, so if they've just been accepted in 1563 as inspired, before then the Catholics didn't even accept them. The Catholics rejected them. But in 1563, the Council of, uh, of Trent, they were accepted. 1563. 1563. Let's do a little math here. That's what? 50 years? 50 years later, now all of a sudden they're going to be accepted. Uh, 50 years after they're accepted, now they're included in the King James Bible. And you know what, friends? Just because something's included between the covers of a book does not mean that it's inspired. Look, I have some, I have some Bible maps in my, in my Bible. I know they're not inspired because they're, they've got some the geography wrong. Look, they've got, they've got some question marks where some of these towns are. Well, if they were inspired, they wouldn't have to have a question mark beside it. See that? They've got Mount Sinai down here on the, on the uh, Sinai Peninsula. Well, the Bible says it's in Arabia. See that? So the, the maps are not accurate. They're not inspired. And in the back of my Bible, I've got, uh, I've got some different uh, writings that are, uh, that are included. We've got, I've got the Bible Reader's Aids, a, a topical related to the study and understanding of the Holy Scriptures by Reverend Charles H.H. H. Wright, D.D. And then you've got the summary of the books of the Bible, and you've got the... Um, uh, uh, study notes or for guidelines from uh, Malachi to Matthew by B.J. Fernie, Ph.D. Is that inspired? No. Well, it's in, it's in the Bible. It's in my King James Bible. Friends, you may have a study Bible. That's not what's inspired. Those study notes, those, those footnotes where, where uh, Jerry Falwell or somebody has added something to it, that's not inspired. You need to stay away from those footnotes and the study things in the end. You just need to stay with the text. All right? So just because it's between the covers doesn't mean it's inspired. And the Apocrypha, just because it was included with the, the King James Bible in the beginning, doesn't mean that it was inspired. You know, the, the Apocrypha doesn't even claim inspiration. Now, you would think well, if a book is going to be passed off as inspired, it would at least claim inspiration. The Apocrypha does that. Nowhere does it claim inspiration. Well, that right there ought to tell you, well, red flag here, it doesn't even claim to be inspired from God. I mean, my word, Ellen G. White from the Seventh-day Adventist and, and um, Joseph Smith of the, of the Mormons, at least they claimed to have a message from God, you know. At least they claimed inspiration. That's more than what the, the Apocrypha does. But just to show you how the, the Apocrypha is uh, uh, so twisted. Go ahead and put the phone lines up, Matt. Somebody might have a have a phone, uh, have a question or something, and uh, we'll try to get that. I've kind of kind of gone on and lost track of time here. Now listen to what the apocrypha says. Now say one thing. One of the earmarks of inspiration, friends, is does it contradict something else that is known to be inspired? Well, look at this. Now this is from uh, uh, Second Maccabees. This is the same book of the apocrypha that uh, Mr. Eli James got his. White people, the Caucasian people, are, are God's chosen people. He says, he took up a collection, man by man, to the amount of 2,000 drachmas of silver and sent it to Jerusalem to provide for a sin offering. Now, friends, do you, in, in the Bible, did they take up a collection for a sin offering? No, that would, that would be contrary to what, Leviticus says, all right? So we know that's not right. In doing this, he acted very well and honorably taking account of the resurrection, for if he were not expecting uh, that those who had fallen would rise again, notice uh, this is behind that lower one-third here, it says, it would have been superfluous and foolish to pray for the dead. Now, friends, do we pray for the dead? Does the Bible talk about praying for the dead? No, it doesn't. It doesn't teach that. Now, you can see why the Catholics might hold on to this. It sounds like a lot of Catholic doctrine here. 
but it contradicts other writings that you know are inspired. And therefore, it was rejected. All right, 2 Maccabees goes on to say that if he was looking to, to the splendid reward that is later for those who have fallen asleep in godliness, it was a holy and pious thought. Therefore, he made atonement for the dead that they might be delivered from their sins. Friend, once you die, are you going to be delivered from your sin? Once you die, can you be delivered from your sin? That's not like, that's not like the Mormons, doesn't it? Be baptized for the dead? Well, I'm going to go back. I'm going to be baptized once for grandma. I'm going to be baptized once for Uncle Jesse. I'm going to be baptized for, you know, Aunt Sally. I'm going to be baptized for somebody I don't know just 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 because they weren't, you know. I'm, I'm, friends, can you make atonement for the dead? You see why the book of Maccabees and the Apocrypha are rejected? Because they go, it's contrary to what the Bible says. It's contrary to what you know are inspired. All right? Let's look at this one. Uh, this is Tobit, chapter 12, verse 8 and 9. It is better to give alms than to treasure up gold, for almsgiving delivers from death, and it will purge away every sin. Now, that sounds like the Catholic doctrine of uh, uh, in paying for and buying indulgences, you know. Can you, can you buy your sin? Can you buy sin being purged away? Oh, give enough money and we'll pray for you. Yeah. No, friends. That's not how the Bible, that's not how the Bible talks about purging away sin. The Bible has always talked about purging away sin. Sin uh, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission, Hebrews 9.22. And ultimately, it's the blood of Christ that's going to forgive sins, not the, not the giving of alms, doing good deeds, or giving money. You see why this would be rejected? But yet, people are getting their doctrine from the book of Maccabees, or from the book of Tobit, or from the Apocrypha in general. That's why it's rejected. That's why it's not inspired. It doesn't claim inspiration. All it does is it claims to fill in some gaps, the little stories, fill in gaps about things that are not recorded, that we don't have recording of. You know? And so it's like, well, it's someone's idea of this is what might have happened. Well, friends, that, those might be good stories, but they're not inspired. They're not inspired. And by the way, think about this. The Apocrypha, supposedly was written during those 400 years of silence between Malachi and, and Matthew. Isn't it interesting that our Lord never quotes anything from the Apocrypha? And if anyone could have verified the Apocrypha, if anyone could have verified any kind of writings that were going on during that foreign times, it would have been our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Yet he didn't. So, what does that tell you about, about your inspiration? You're on the word from the Lord. You're on the word from the Lord. This is James. This is he. Uh, when was that uh, set of books taken out? Uh, I don't know for sure, but I, I, I don't know. I can't give you an exact date on that. I know that it was rejected, as we said, it was rejected for, you know, 1,500 years as being non-inspired, and, uh, and and some Bibles even still have it in there. You know, you can probably still get a Bible, but probably even get a King James Bible that has it uh, between the covers, but it's not, you know, it's not considered to be inspired by anybody that would believe the Bible because it contradicts. Yeah, I've studied that uh, before, but I've never found out that no one has said when it was taken out and by whom it was taken out. Right. But it was originally in the King James. Well, yeah, and I don't know, you know, I don't know when it was taken in or out of the King James, but, you know, when we're talking about the, 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 the inspired canon, you know, the inspired Bible, God never put it in there at all. So... If anybody put it between the covers of a book, it had to be a man. But, it, you know, it wasn't God. That's, okay. and, and that's I, the most I was important just asking thing, right? because it was in the original King James. Yeah. I, but, but I've uh, yet to find out when and who took it out, even though it's not inspired. It was in the original King James. Right. I appreciate your information. So okay. All right. Thank you. Uh -huh.
Yeah, uh, but like I said, you know, don't 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 confuse what I'm saying here uh, with uh, even though it may have been in the in the original King James or included in the King James early on, uh, that doesn't that doesn't mean it was inspired. Uh, I have, uh, you know, like I said, everybody has has Bibles that have all kinds of study notes and stuff in it that are definitely not inspired, and. Uh, I, I don't consider that part of the Bible. If someone says, read me something from the Bible, I, I never go, I never read the study notes. You know, I read the books that I know are part of the inspired canon. You know, I would read Genesis to Revelation, but nothing, nothing extra. And, uh, and, and that's another thing too, you know, the Jews were afraid to add anything to this. Anything that was non, that was non-inspired, uh, anything that was not inspired, you know, they wouldn't dare add it to the canon because there is a, there's a condemnation all through the Bible about adding to or taking away from the Scriptures. All right? Deuteronomy, Proverbs, and Revelation. In the beginning, the middle, and the end, there's, all, there's, a, there's a condemnation for anyone who would, uh, uh, who would add to or take away. So if these belong... In the new inspired canon, then someone's going to be condemned. But if they belonged in the inspired canon, you couldn't take them away. See that? All right. I got a note here that says uh, uh, 1885. I don't know uh, who who that was that, that that took it out or who made the decision not to put it in the King James Bible anymore. But bottom line is, it didn't it didn't belong as part of the Bible to start with. Okay. Uh, yeah, let me give you one more quote here from the from the um, uh, book of Maccabees. This is Baruch, uh, the book of Baruch. Now, Baruch was uh, uh, a Jeremiah's companion. He was a scribe. And the Bible says Baruch wrote in uh, Baruch, the son of Neriah, he wrote in Babylon in the fifth year on the seventh day of the month at the time when the Chaldeans took Jerusalem and burned it with fire. Now, that's Baruch chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Now, look at this. Now we're going to compare this to Jeremiah. Now Jeremiah, we know is inspired. And the Bible says, now in the fifth month and the tenth day of the month, which was the 19th year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, that uh, Nebuzaradan, captain of the guard, which served the king of Babylon, uh, came to Jerusalem and burned the house of the Lord and the king's house and the house of the great men and burned with fire. So Jeremiah says that it was in the fifth month of the, of the, uh, the fifth month and the tenth day of the month uh, it's when all this took place. And where was Baruch? Now, this is the, the, the key thing. Baruch, in the book of Maccabee, and, and in the Apocrypha, says that he was in Babylon. But Jeremiah says, Baruch, the son of, of Neriah, and Jeremiah the prophet, they came into the land of Egypt. They were in Egypt when Jerusalem was burned. Now, how can Baruch be writing in Babylon and be in Egypt at the same time. You have to have a mighty fast camel to get down there and do that. Now who are you going to believe? Are you going to believe Baruch in the Apocrypha or are you going to believe Jeremiah? I'm going to believe Jeremiah because I know Jeremiah the prophet and he was always considered to be a prophet. All right? And so there you have proof of inspiration, and you need to take the inspired one other than the non-inspired one. You're on the word from the Lord. Yes, sir. It was a few weeks ago when the KKK was on, <coughs> and the and the two um, Jessicas, and I think his name was Micah. Mm-hmm. That was on. Okay, um, towards the end of the program, they was reading. The KKK was reading about how they donated money to different places to do different things. Right. And that um, no matter how against the KKK were, that uh, the two Jessica was and Micah, when they said that they would donate money mm-hmm. uh, for um, some sort of 
Kamikazes, um, the two Jessicas jumped at that to accept the money. Yeah, actually, and, what, it wasn't. It wasn't two. It was just one. Jessica was on that show. It was. It was um, Jessica and a, and a guy named Chad. It wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't Jessica Griffin and Jessica Robinson. They weren't both on the show at that time. Okay, but um, both well the the other two jumped at the um, at the offer for money. Yeah, when uh -huh. they offered money for uh, okay. whatever. Okay. Uh, but they could donate it for. Um, so, they accepted the money. We're, we're, and and Micah, they offered it to Micah, and I was so proud that. He turned it down, no matter what they said to him. Right. And right. but the other two just jumped at it, no matter how much it, how much it was. It didn't matter how much they were against. Right. The KKK and what right. they stood for, and what they did in the past, or anything. Right. When it came to the money, when they offered that money, oh, right, yeah, that was that, that's that was very that's very hypocritical, wasn't it? Listen, I, I appreciate your call. I've, I've just got a few more seconds. I need to wrap up. So yeah, I was I was okay. I was glad Micah said what he said. That was good. He made a good point there. I All just right. wondered how many other people uh, recognized that. I don't know. I don't know. A lot of people are blinded by the money, aren't they? Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for your call. Thanks for your call. All right. So, folks, uh, got a little off topic there, but but you see what we're talking about here. So, if a Bible, if a book contradicts something you know to be inspired from, you got to reject it. And so, the danger is not not understanding what is accepted. But when it comes to the Bible, especially the Old Testament, uh, what our Lord accepted as the inspired writings of God in the Old Testament, that's what we accepted, or that's what we should accept today. And what he had is the same thing we have today. God's word will endure forever. And so this is why we hold on to the Bible. You can know for confidence, know for sure, that what you have in your hand is the word of God. And uh, you can know that when you ask, what does the Bible say, you'll always get a word from the Lord. Thanks for your attention. Have a good night. See you next week. you making star news a part of your day a lot of things to cover on this thursday including a five thousand dollar reward being offered for a homicide information to solve a homicide that happened last year in rockingham county that information was released earlier today we've got uh, the details coming up and how you can help rockingham county law enforcement authorities with that case that's coming up in this hour and lots of other news, and I'll tell you more about that in just a moment. Matt Smith is standing by. He's in the Forecast Center in Reidsville with a look at our forecast for the weekend. I know a lot of you may have plans to get out and do something, maybe head to the pool. After all, before you know it, the pool will be closed for the season, so enjoy it while you can. You may have plans to do other things, so we'll find out what the forecast will be, and Matt's here to give us all of that. That's just moments from now. Right now, let's go ahead and take a look at some of the top stories of the day. Fire officials everywhere carry the same messages to citizens in their jurisdictions day in and day out, and that's the message that smoke detectors do save 